Good morning, friends of Riverbend United Church here in Edmonton, Alberta. Thank you for tuning in to worship this morning. We appreciate that. And I trust that all of you who are watching are doing so either because you are knowing a deeper meaning in your life and connecting with the church is how you are expressing that, or perhaps because you're seeking a deeper meaning in your life and connecting with the church is how you express that journey. Maybe you enjoy the fellowship, the connection with other folks of the church. For whatever reason you are tuning in, thanks for being here. We remember that we are a treaty people, that everything we do here in these lands occurs on Treaty 6 lands, and that we are guests here. May our lives honor those who have come before us. We're also an affirming congregation, which means no matter what, you are welcome here. I invite you to take a look at the little arrow on the bottom right corner of your video. If you click that, you'll see a description of the service and you can see what's coming. Parents, you can go get your children. We will have a children's time with Crystal and Adelaide in a few minutes. This morning, we begin a new segment of our worship called Faces of Faith. I'm kind of excited about this. It will be simply a five-minute introduction to various church members, starting with our board, members of our official board, and they will share with us what inspires them about being part of this church and their faith life. So stay tuned for that as well. This morning we start that program off with Jill and Doug Spanner. And I'm grateful to Jill for being our lay reader this morning. Let's take a breath and share with our choir in singing, Jesus Came Bringing Hope. worship people of faith, people of doubt, people just trying to make it through another day. Come and sing and pray and listen and share in the good news that loves, love lives eternally. We open with a prayer written by John Moses of Aylesford United Church in Aylesford, Nova Scotia. Gracious God, we want to see your goodness in the land of the living here and now, in the midst of deep fears and desperate hopes. Give us grace to put our trust in you, even when our hearts cry out in longing. Help us notice the whisper of your presence amid all the noise and news that clamor and threaten. May we let your love throw, flow through us and carry us onward in a new day. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Our opening hymn is Thine is the Glory, led by our choir. Okay. 
I decided to take you guys outside for our children's sermon. Today we're going to talk about something super fun to do in the summer and the springtime. Today we're going to talk about kites. kites. That's right. Have you ever wished you were a kite? What about you guys at home? What, have you ever wished for wished you were a kite? No. No? How about we pretend we're all kites right now and fly around and let the air feel us and lift us up and let our hair flow in the wind. When you fly a kite, where do you usually fly a kite? Um, I usually take mine to a park or a field. Yeah? yeah. Do you usually take it to a park or a field? Yeah. yeah. In our lives with Jesus, we have a lot in common with kites. The most important thing is that one day we could fly too. We have freedom and we could fly like kites. Um, the key to a good flight, flying kite, I should say, is the kite dynamics. How do kites fly so high into the sky, Adelaide? When you get a kite up in the air, how does it stay up there? The wind, the wind pushes and pulls it, and it it beats against the the skin of the kites, the and wind. it keeps it up there. That's right. Yeah, for a long time. As a person runs with the kite, the wind pressing onto the kite, this force is called a lift. This lift is pushing us into the air. Do you feel it? At the same time, another force is pulling back. This force is called a drag, and it's caused by the pressure of someone pulling on the string, not letting it go completely. Have you, can you feel the tug when you go like this? The next thing we're going to talk about is the kite spine. Can I see this? This is a makeshift kite Adelaide and I built not too long ago because the kite that we have at home is a little bigger and it doesn't really um, give the gist of this lecture. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the makeshift one a little bit. Think of a kite spine, the wooden part that holds the canvas or plastic in place. It's strong, like, a di like in a diamond kite. It's shaped like a cross. Do you see the cross here? Yeah. As Jesus said, anyone who wishes to come with me must take up his cross daily and follow me. He meant that people should sacrifice their wants for his wants. With a kite, it is easy to see that if you are a canvas and Jesus is the cross, attaching yourself to him will make you stronger and take you higher up in the air. Does that make sense, Ads? Yeah. Yeah? 
Next, we're going to talk about the kite tail. Think of your long, pretty tail. With kites, the tail is what keeps the kite from spinning out of control. Have you ever seen a kite lose its tail, Adelaide? No. It starts doing really fast circles and tumbling towards the crown. To, towards the ground, sorry. A kite can't fly without its tail. A tail is a lot like our faith, which comes from hearing the word God. According to Romans, think of every knot in your tail as an important message of the scripture. One that you remember in a time of trouble. And there's a couple knots in this kite as well. Here's one to remember when you feel like you might spin out of control like the kite in the wind. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Let's say Psalm 23, 4 together as we fly. We can say that over and over when we feel afraid and keep, keep it from spiraling. The next thing that's important with kites is the wind. The wind is like the Holy Spirit. It takes you closer to Jesus and keeps you up when life circumstances wants to take you down. The Holy Spirit will give you power when it comes upon you and you will be witnesses. People don't notice kites when they're on the ground, do they? No. No. When you go to a park, where do you look for kites? In the air. In the sky. But how about when they're flying in the sky? What about that makes you pay attention to them? So everyone who comes past sees them because they're up in the sky and it's something beautiful for you to look at. And they make you kind of smile. Kites always make me smile. And lastly, we're going to talk about another important part of the kite, which is the string. Who holds on the string of the kite? The person on the ground does, that's right. Yeah. And what happens if the, if the string breaks, Adelaide? The kite will just fly a little bit and then it'll crash to the ground. The string is what gives the kite drag. It's the very thing that keeps it up in the air. What is the string like? Why is the string so important? Because without it, the kite would be gone. It wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to hold it back and it would just fly away. Yeah. God can seem far off like a speck. It seems sometimes when we pray that our connection to him is only a thread. We can always hear him. All we can feel is that tug telling us where to go and what to do next. Right? It feels awkward. We're not always sure what that means. No. However, his connection to us is very strong. He's not going to go let he's not going to let go of that string. Though people may stumble, they will always be hurled headlong. For the Lord's hold him up by the hand. The Lord always knows where we are and and what ways we need to they need to pull us to keep our balance of our cross, our tail, the wind, and himself. And someday when it's time, he will reel us in. And we will find ourselves cradled in his loving arms. After a long flight and our days are over. So Let's think of ourselves as kites and our lives with Jesus as taking us higher and making us freer. Anyway, me and Adelaide are going to go fly some kites. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. See you next week. Bye.
Before I read the scripture, I'd just like to fill you in on a conference that Reverend Valerie and I attended on May 4th and 6th. The conference was the third Northern Spirit Regional Council meeting. Northern Spirit is the national church body that combines the former Edmonton Presbytery and several other presbyteries and Alberta Northwest Conference. 165 people attended the Zoom meeting, which was themed loving our neighbor and ourselves. The work of the church included worship, the welcoming and ordination of one new minister, voting on several proposals brought forward by committees of the Northern Spirit region, some to go on to the 44th General Council meeting to be held July 26, 22nd to 26, 2022. It's a lot of 20s. Uh, 11 commissioners, both lay and ministerial staff, um, to General Council were also elected and covenanted to represent the region. The proposals included several updates to the United Church Manual, one proposal from the Anti-Racism Committee to commemorate Emancipation Sunday on the week of August 1st. This date is the anniversary of the vote by the British Parliament in 1834 to abolish slavery, meaning that no human being could be owned by another in Canada from that day on. The proposal vote passed and it will be sent forward to General Council. The final proposal was put forward by the Right Relations Network and called for the Northern Spirit Regional Council to publicly oppose the proposed Alberta K-6 Social Studies curriculum. It also passed and the region will send a public letter to the Government of Alberta expressing its grave concerns with the curriculum as proposed and encourages communities of faith to send their own letters of concern to the government of Alberta and local school boards. This proposal also passed. Please contact me about information for this, about this curriculum if interested. And our scripture from the, for today is from Luke 24, verses 44 to 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what has been promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Thanks to Jill for that. Today, it's called Ascension Day. It's not a day I have traditionally throughout my ministry focused on. It occurs 10 days before Pentecost, 40 days after Easter. So the actual day was Wednesday, and we are honoring it today on this last Sunday of Easter. First, just a wee bit of Bible study. This event, the Ascension of Jesus, from Luke's Gospel that Jill just read, occurs on the day of Jesus' resurrection, according to Luke, right after the story of the road to Emmaus. If you missed the contemporary rendition of that story offered to us by Emily Bamforth a couple of weeks ago, 
we encourage you to go back on YouTube and watch that. We, it was an amazing uh, way to view that story in these days. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus ascends on the day of his resurrection. And now we get a little bit of contradiction. Scholars are quite sure that the writer of the Gospel of Luke is the same as the writer of the book of Acts. In Acts, Jesus remains with the disciples for 40 days after the resurrection before he ascends. Acts 1 says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself alive to the disciples by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise that was coming. It goes on with Jesus saying, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, it, and then it says, When Jesus had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So in Luke, Jesus ascends on the day of his resurrection, apparently. In Acts, apparently, also written by Luke, Jesus was with the disciples 40 days and then ascends. The disciples in Acts do, as he said, going to Jerusalem where they wait 10 days and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. We celebrate that event as Pentecost next Sunday. Pentecost, 50, Pente. So these are the 50 days of Easter. The 40, Jesus was with the disciples after he was resurrected, plus the 10, they waited for the Holy Spirit after he ascends. This apparent contradiction may be resolved if we picture that Luke simply left out 40 days before he says, then Jesus is lifted up. It, it's possible. It's possible. Unlikely to me, but it's possible. But let's leave the whole question of timing in Luke's different versions aside for a moment because we have more important things on the table today. What is this whole ascension thing? What does it mean that Jesus ascends? It's a beautiful word, isn't it? Ascend. Luke tells us that he took the disciples out of the city to Bethany. It's not actually that far. It's up on the Mount of Olives, and in these days is within the hubbub of Jerusalem, but in those days was out of the city. There, Jesus tells them to wait for the promised coming of the Spirit. He blesses them. He withdraws from them. And then Luke says, quote, he was carried up into heaven. What does this mean? Maybe Luke is interpreting these events through the lens of the three-tiered universe common in the Greco-Roman world in those days, with heaven above a flat earth and hell or Sheol below. But Luke, we know, is highly educated, and he seems to be a careful writer committed to giving a testament to Jesus' life that has integrity. Luke likely would have been aware that such a worldview had already been discredited by scholars several hundred years before he was writing. They knew by then that the earth was not flat. The post-resurrection appearance stories of Jesus 
given by our gospel writers and by Paul make a point of Jesus' body. Put your finger in my side, Thomas, to know that I am real, he says in John's gospel. And in Luke's story of the disciples meeting Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he is recognized in the breaking of the bread. That's a very bodily, physical action. And yet we see the risen Jesus vanishing before their eyes and walking through walls. Those are actions of spirit. So which is it? Was he experienced as body or as spirit? Both? And in this ascension story, did he ascend as body, as spirit? And to where? Into what? As what? I can't answer these questions, as you know, that are stirred by the story of Jesus' ascension. But I know that it brings me right into this intersection of body and spirit, this intersection of what is familiar to us in our everyday mundane lives and what is more, this intersection of earth and heaven, not the Hallmark greeting card heaven, but heaven as a deeper dimension to life. Perhaps the divine dimension that is here now that we don't necessarily see, except in fleeting moments. Which brings us to the thin places of life. Thin places are those moments, events, spaces, these places on earth, these traditions amongst humanity, ceremonies, thresholds of life where we know the more opens. In such moments and spaces, we recognize that there is more to life, a deeper dimension than we are familiar with most of our days. Thin places are where the veil between this world and the beyond grows very thin. Scholars sometimes use the fancy word liminal. Try saying that, it rolls off your tongue. It's quite poetic, liminal, to refer to such spaces and moments. Liminal means quote, occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or a threshold, end quote, liminal. Think of those moments early in the morning when you're floating between sleep and awake. Think of dusk when day is almost done and night is not yet come. Think of where water and sand meet and mingle as shore. Neither water nor sand, but somehow both. These spaces where a deeper dimension intersects with our familiar lives are liminal. They are potent, revealing, igniting, compelling. The veil between here and there becomes so thin that we aren't sure which side we are on. Such a moment, such a space is, simply put, holy. When have you experienced a thin place? 
In her sermon called Thin Places, Barbara Brown Taylor points out how the Bible is full of thin places. Moses at the burning bush, Jacob and the ladder of angels, Job and the voice out of the whirlwind. Taylor goes on, all in all things don't work that way anymore. Most bushes don't give off the slightest bit of heat. Most ladders don't have anyone's footprints on them except our own. And most whirlwinds do not say anything but whoosh. She says, you will have to ask someone where God has gone. I don't know. But I do know plenty of people who are in hot pursuit. The words of Barbara Brown Taylor. Religious pilgrimages in all of our traditions are for the sake of being in hot pursuit of this place, this space where we meet the holy, where we meet God. The pursuit itself, it seems to me, reveals a hidden awareness within humanity that we might be walking right on top of something sacred, right through it, without recognizing it. And so we go and seek it. A line from Alice Walker's The Color Purple comes to mind. I think it beeps as God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. Jesus invites us into a depth of far greater awareness than what we are familiar with in our everyday lives. He opens our eyes by opening our hearts. He opens us to this space where love comes from. Jesus opens us to the holy. In this sense, Jesus is a thin place. A thin place. Thin places have several things in common, I believe. Thin places tell us there is more to life than we are familiar with. Thin places bring a sense of awe and mystery and humility. Thin places ignite our sense of the holy. Thin places are incomprehensible. No matter how hard we try, we cannot make logical sense of them. Thin places change our perspective, always broadening it, and they change us. Thin places don't leave us wanting, they leave us believing. Thin places bring a new beginning. What thin places, thin moments, thin spaces have you experienced? We'll hear about that from Jill and Doug Spanner in a moment. The ascension story of Jesus being lifted up is a punctuation point on his life and death and resurrection. It intermingles body and spirit, heaven and earth, the familiar and mundane with the vast beyond. It doesn't leave the disciples wanting more. It leaves them ready because of the more. It brings a sense of fulfillment. It has Jesus saying, I have shown you all these things. You will not be alone. Now go and live by this. May we hear and open and believe and respond. Amen.
as promised, we're going to hear from Doug and Jill Spanner in this new uh, segment of worship called Faces of Faith. They are the guinea pigs today, the very first out of the shoot, and I'm grateful to them for being willing to give this a go. So thank you, Doug and Jill. I feel like I'm doing some kind of a talk show. <laughs> um, will you all We're just introduce? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> will you all just introduce yourselves and um, sort of your connection? Tell us about your connection to the church as well. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Jill Spanner, and um, I've been coming to the church for about. 30 years now came originally I was raised in the United Church and came drifted away as most of us do in my 20s and came back when our children were small wanting a community an intergenerational community for them to be raised in uh, the way I was um, since that time I've uh, moved from pew sitter to um, committee member, chairman of the board at one point. Um, I'm actively involved with the turkey team. I was the chair of the affirming committee. I currently am co-facilitating the uh, Truth and Rec Reconciliation group. Um, and I am the lay representative to the uh, Northern Spirit Council, which is the the body that um, we're represented at for of the um, national church. Okay, let me just back up and ask you what you mean by Turkey Team. Some people don't necessarily know what that means. Briefly, it's a group of us. Uh, we like to refer to ourselves as a movement rather than a committee. We are interested. Are usually our initiatives involve food and feeding either the congregation or the congregation and community members. Um, yeah. Okay. We originally made uh, a turkey dinner for the church and that's where the name came from. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back and ask you what, why you, you do all these things for the church, what, what you enjoy or what inspires you, but, but let's, um, let's have, let's, Doug, can you tell us what? about you? Um, I'm Doug Spanner. I, um, I'm i uh, Jill's husband. Uh, and she's the reason I come to the United Church because I um, was not raised in the United Church. I was, um, um, my father was Jewish and my mother, um, my mother was actually a member of the United Church, but she had stopped going after she had um, met my father and um, and we were raised largely in sort of a secular household. And um, I had wandered rather widely through various traditions. Um, but after I got married, we started, Jill started coming because she wanted the children to have a place. And so I came and the children loved it. The children absolutely loved everything about um, this faith community. And I just kept coming. And I, I had some very powerful experiences with, um, with Reverend Cantillon. When we first started coming and uh, I decided to be baptized as a member of this um, faith tradition and um, continue to come and continue to love the community. I mostly, I, I love the music and I've been quite involved over the last probably five or 10 years with uh, the music ministry of the church, uh, both with the, with the uh, choir and with the, um, with the ensemble. And that's been a big part of my life over the last 10 years, um, which I desperately miss <laughs> right now. Mm, yeah, that's uh, tough. And that's, that's my story. I just keep coming because I, I love coming. <laughs> I, I remember, I don't know how long ago, a couple of years ago, Doug, I remember you telling me that there's no place you'd rather be or maybe you said almost no place you'd rather be than singing in your church and that really that really touched me Don't oh that's true know. that's true I've, I've had some incredible moments just um 
you know, it's it's always been been energizing to come and sing with uh, with the choir and with Paula, um, and the musicians that have played with us. But I've had some very kind of powerful moments, um, both with the ensemble and with the choir. Yeah. Uh, what we're talking about, well those thin moments, but that's where I've, I've had some of them is just sitting in the choir. And, and also it's a really cool thing because you sit in the choir and you look out over the congregation. So you don't feel, when you're sitting in the pew, sometimes you feel, you know, you're all looking straight ahead and um, you don't, I, I really found that quite powerful is sitting in the front and then looking at all the eyes looking forward. And I just felt that was a really different and much more um, energizing perspective. Yeah, it makes you wish everyone would sit up front during one <laughs> service and, and look yeah. out there. Thanks for that. And and Jill, what what is it that why do you why do you give all that time and energy in all those different ways? What what is it that you enjoy or that connects connects you with the church? I mean, I think like Doug, I I love being there. I love these are my peeps. Um, I've I've told you before. I think that. I find it's a place in my week, in my life, where I think about things, talk about things, participate in activities I don't do anywhere else um, in my life. I don't um, sing with my neighbors and I don't pray with my book club and the other communities that I'm involved in. And, and I really am not really involved in acts of service with other groups as well and that's important to me to to my life so um yeah i keep coming back because it's a place that allows me to um participate in ways that don't happen in the rest of my life okay thanks and uh, to help with today's sermon, what are what are the thin places or the thin spaces for you two where you uh, are most likely to or might encounter the holy? Um, as a family, we've been going to the Naramata Center for 25 years. Oh, sorry, there's our little blind dog just uh, <laughs> walked over. <laughs> um, and we've always said that that was a thin place for us. And our now adult children have said the same thing, specifically walking the labyrinth uh, at the Naramata Center. Um, in BC. In BC, yeah. I think um, we've talked about how we've walked the Camino de Santiago Compostela and we- um, That's not in BC. That's in Spain. And we- uh, certainly experienced that as a thin place as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that these places that Jill mentioned that, that I have also experienced these, um, when you say thin, these, these moments that, that along these places where you feel resonating with something deeper and, and um, and quite mysterious, but they they are always at places that um, that communities have have found um, quite powerful. So there were times along the the Camino in, in Spain where you're walking you're walking a, a pilgrim path that has been walked for a thousand years by thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people so much so that the, the the earth is worn you know below the you know it's like you're walking in a in a in a below the roots below of the, the trees below yeah. the roots of the trees because the, the path has been worn so deeply in the earth and so you just sort of feel this, this resonance this energy um of other you know, pilgrims that that other seekers that have been walking this path for whatever reason, but the energy, the community that is that is just ever present there is just. I think that's what makes those places very thin. Same with Naramata. You know, it's a it's a place, a United Church um, retreat center, and it's it's you know thousands of of people have gone there for thousands of different reasons. But walking that that the labyrinth there is an extraordinary. Um, 
there's been times there where I remember one night we walked there and it had been sort of a, after a really powerful week and they placed lanterns there and it was almost like electric sparks were coming out of your fingertips. It was just so powerful. You just felt mm. like you were going to take flight. And I've had moments like that. And so that's, those are, those are places I think where you, the shared energy, but I think one of the other things that's happened over the years is this idea of simply practicing the presence of God, wherever you are. And, um, and I found that to be really quite powerful. I, I certainly feel that in the church. I feel that sitting in the choir, I've had moments singing with, with my, with my brothers and sisters in the choir and uh, my, my friends in the ensemble where we've had moments of incredible, uh, almost ecstatic joy when we've sung and played together. But just walking in the river valley sometimes or walking with my dog or, or, or just being still. Um, I mean, I don't think that, that, that God exists more in one place than another, but um, certainly there are places where God seems easily, more easily accessible. But I, but I think to practice that presence wherever you are is something I'm learning as I get older and grayer. And, and uh, well, I hope to keep practicing that um, till my last breath. Sweet. Okay. Well, thank you both for uh, jumping in like this. I appreciate it. It's a it's a different format, obviously, but um, I'm really grateful to you both, Doug and Jill Spanner. And we are going to magically transport Jill through one of those thin places <laughs> straight into the sanctuary. I think you're even going to be Superman and change clothes, maybe. Um, oh, on the way. Yes, I, I yeah, am. Yeah. On the way. <laughs> Uh, so thank you both, and um, we'll transition now to Jill leading us through the prayers of the people. We haven't recorded this interview yet, so I hope we sounded wise. Um, I will now read the prayers of the people written by Joy Cohen of Heritage United Church in Regina. Gracious God, you are our sacred space within a swirling story. You are our source of calm amidst the chaos. May we become more aware of your constant, gentle presence. May your love fill us, your peace fulfill us. In this time of pandemic, may we be reminded and reassured that we are truly yours. We share in a time of silent personal prayer. Before a word is on our lips, you hear it, God of love, and we are grateful. Our final hymn is, I See a New Heaven.
waters of love. I see a new heaven. I see a new earth as the old one will pass away. Without your rifles and without Christ's calls to all people who abide in the land. There, there where we work with the love of healing hands, laboring Thanks to our choir for that hymn and all their beautiful musical work over this year, these 14 months. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. I do hope you have a beauty-filled week, perhaps encountering some thin places where you meet the holy and the holy meets you. May we go out with the words of the prophet Isaiah. Let us go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before us shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Go in peace, friends. Amen. So there's our girl. <laughs> and there's our little girl. Stuff. Yes. Sorry? Our little sweet dog from India. And her name is Jenna. Yes. Jenna. Yeah. Jenna. Good. Jenna. And she's blind. And she's blind. All right. But she is a sweet girl. <laughs>